if the Belt and Road Initiative is really as helpful as you just said to the developing countries, then why there's a huge negative news about Chinese investments in those regions? Where does all this negative news come from? Where does this debt trap diplomacy term come from? Yeah, well, I can tell you a, a funny story. Uh, first, it, when the U.S. Uh, Foreign Secretary Rex Tillerson under the Trump administration was going to Africa to warn African nations against working with China, a Chinese ambassador, I think it was in South Africa, he said, you know, the American ambassador, he lands in an airport in Africa, which was built by China. Then he travels by car on a road built by China. And then he goes and gives a speech in a building built by China. And then he tells people, be careful not to work with China. <laughs> so so that, that's, that tells a very good story because when you come to reality, it's completely different. Now, there are two things about the debt trap. Now, uh, there are institutions I reference in my work, of course, uh, that really debunk the whole uh, myth of the debt trap, including American uh, institutions. Uh, but there are two things. It's the size of the debt owed to China is not what people think. You know, as I, as I wrote recently in my research articles on Sri Lanka and Pakistan, it's 10% in both countries. That's government debt. But for the international financial institutions, it's about 40 to 50 to 60%. There is another point which people don't pay attention to is how is the debt incurred? Where do these nations use the debt or the loans they get from China and the loans they get from the West? The debt, the, the loans they get from China are invested in infrastructure, which means that more than infrastructure, as any sane human being knows that clean water, electricity, better roads, better railways, better ports and airports and hospitals and schools improve the productivity of society. That's where the Chinese uh, loans go. And when you improve your productivity, your ability to pay back increases. The loans from the West and from Japan and the Asian Investment Bank, which is not really Asian, it's Japanese, American, British, Australian, and so on. These loans are usually given in emergency situations to countries who are in trouble to cover their trade deficit and uh, fiscal deficit. So that money evaporates immediately because you are not using that to solve the core problem, which is the lack of productivity in society, the lack of infrastructure, which is the source of the problem. But then this debt is piled upon each other. Now, there is another thing which comes from Western financial institutions. It's called the international bond markets, which Sri Lanka's problem is actually, and also Pakistan and many countries. These, these are private financial markets where Governments go to borrow money when they can't get it from the IMF or the World Bank or somewhere else at low rates. They go and borrow money from these financial markets who are looking for profit. And they borrow this money also to cover deficit, not to build new things which will help them. And the interest rates are very high on these, these loans. But by time, these loans just become bigger and bigger and the countries don't manage to pay them back. So what the financial institutions like big, big investors in the United States, for example, BlackRock and a British fund called Ashmore, I mean, they have trillions of dollars in, in their funds and they buy the debt of countries. So what they do, they sell this debt to other called so-called vulture funds. I mean, vultures, you know, which eat cow diversions. So. And these funds then make profit by buying the debt of these poor countries who are in trouble. And then they demand full payment in time, otherwise they get punished. So that's what you discover is that not only that China's share of the debt of those countries is small, China's loans are qualitatively different because they help those countries cope with their problems while the debt incurred from Western institutions 
they worsen the situation. And these countries become hostage to conditionalities and political like Sri Lanka. Now there's a huge investment by the United States, not in infrastructure, but in political groups and, and to move them into the so-called Indo-Pacific strategy away from China mm. and their neutral policy. So that's where, but the story where it comes from, and I did a lot of research on that myself, but there is there was, if you look at the internet and try to search where this, this thing start, it started in earnest in May, 2018. There is nothing before that except for a few uh, discussions in India by anti-Chinese groups who were pissed off with the in Chinese investments in Sri Lanka, that India is losing Sri Lanka. So they came up with this term, debt trap, uh, for strategic reasons. But the real story started in May when the State Department, uh, not through a press release, but they sent out a report, a study, to all the big media in the world. Uh, it was a study not, you know, they say it's an academic study from Harvard, but I can show you where the whole thing uh, started. Wow. This was in 2009. In 2009, there was a massive food crisis in the world. I remember I mm -hmm. and some colleagues went to Rome in Italy because there was a global summit where world leaders came there to discuss the food crisis in 2009. And we went there to cover this summit. At the same time, Western media, but especially the British media, like The Guardian, this is from The Guardian, came out with a story uh, that China has 1 million farmers now invading Africa, taking over land, grabbing the land of Africans, producing food for China. Now, I, I looked at this and I said, Okay, they say this is according to, to, to a, a, a UN report. So if you see here, they say, see the full FAO report, the Food and Agriculture Organization report, okay? So how many people in Britain click on it and read a 90 page, terribly boring report? <laughs> Almost none. So I did. I, I, I'm looking for truth, not in simply facts, but I want to find out exactly what do they mean, because this is really serious. A million Chinese farmers have invade, invaded Africa. So I click on the report, I read the report once, there's nothing about China or a million. Actually, what it says is that China has certain investments and cooperation with certain governments. There's nothing in the report. So I read it again. <laughs> I say, where did they come with this 1 million farmers? What it shows that this is a fallacy of composition because if you confront the writer, they say, well, I didn't mean that the report says, but this is the report talking about uh, land in Africa being taken over. So anyway, so this is a big lie. I sent them a message and they did not have not removed it from their website yet. But then I went and studied who is grabbing land in Africa. It turns out, that British, mostly British and Scandinavian and German and other companies have taken over millions of hectares of land in Africa, not to produce food, but to produce sugarcane and other oil rich uh, crops to produce biofuels for cars in Europe. And this was a report done by Friends of Earth. I also studied a, a report uh, by the European Union. They sent a commission and they actually confirmed this, that it's the Europeans who are grabbing the land in Africa, not the Chinese. So anyway, I, what I, so I became an expert in finding out these things because what you have to do, I mean, truth is not simply a, finding facts because many facts are fabricated statistics mm -hmm. statistics can be fabricated but you have to have a hypothesis in your mind why this is being pushed what is the motive to push this and of course when you find one case two case three cases that this is fake then you know that all the others are fake but you have to check every case anyway for your credibility but i want to share with you why this is being done and I would borrow from 
um, from psychology. There's something in psychology called psychological projection. And I will read for you what it says on Wikipedia. It says psychological projection is a process of misinterpreting what is inside as coming from outside. It forms the basis of empathy by the protection of personal experiences to understand someone else's subjective world. In its malignant form, in its worst form, it is a defense mechanism in which the ego defends itself against disowned and highly negative parts of the self by denying their existence in themselves and attributing them to others. So you have committed bad things, but this is, a, this is a, like some sort of a, a sickness in a sense. You, you, you project your own misdeeds, things you have committed, bad things you have committed, and deny they exist in you, but then you attribute them to someone else. Say, it's the Chinese did it, but you know, <laughs> so that, that's the idea of projection in general. Yeah, exactly. I remember when I read all these uh, crazy atrocities that they accused China of, for example, what they said about Xinjiang, with all the terms like uh, concentration camps, forced labor, and then uh, what they did to other Uyghur women. I mean, if you are Chinese living in China, all these things, it sounds crazy to you. I mean, we've been living here for so long. We read news all the time. We have interactions with people from Xinjiang all the time. If you think there are so many atrocities like what you said and so many refugees, you think we wouldn't know? I mean, with the internet, any tiny things will explode. And so when they are accusing that much uh, the horrible atrocities that happened in China, I always curious where does that, all this idea come from? Like you must have a wild imagination to picture your enemies doing some horrible things. And then I really look at the reality and everything you can trace back to something happened in the West. <laughs> uh, concentration camps, so like, yeah, put people in prison, in prison for no reasons. So like, I mean, everything you can trace back to some part of their in, of their history. So yeah, that's projection. I mean, why is Julian Assange in prison? They, they want him to die in prison uh, or, or extradite him to the United States because he simply showed the world what the United States have done in Iraq. Now, the problem is that even in Iraq, they are trying to say, oh, it's the Iranians who are doing all these bad things now. So they, they made a, lot, a large part of the Iraqi people enemies of Iran by convincing them that everything bad in Iraq happened is because of Iran, not because of the US and British policy. So anyway, this is, if I go back to this case I told you about in 2018, Okay, so the, 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 the report I mentioned that the State Department distributed to the international media in the middle of, of May. Now here it said that this is the report, it's called Death Book Diplomacy, China's strategic leveraging of its newfound economic influence and the consequences for US foreign policy, Belfer Center mm -hmm. for Science and International Affairs, Harvard Kennedy School. So this is Harvard, you know? So, but there, there is a, uh, it was written by two characters, Sam Parker and Gabriel Leshevitz. Uh, mm. Now, Sam Parker comes, he's not an economist, neither Mrs. Shevitz. Uh, he, they come from security and military intelligence sections. So they have no idea about economics and finances, and they don't talk about these things in the report, actually. The, mm. Parker comes from the Homeland Security uh, Department, which was established after 9-11. Uh, Mrs. Shevitz, it's more interesting. She worked at the Defense Department, but now she works in a defense um, uh, think tank uh, whose head, I don't remember the name, uh, uh, she was supposed to become Biden's defense minister. So Mrs. Shevitz will follow with her into the Defense Department. So those people have nothing to do with economics, but they made this very big 
report about how China is entrapping nations in debt to promote its military strategic advances. And it, the report, and that's what the real story is, was commissioned by the State Department. So those two guys in Harvard did not come up with the idea themselves. They were commissioned. They were told by the State Department to write the report about this thing. Now they removed that from the PDF file, but I still have uh, internet uh, reports from the media. Look, May 23rd, 2018. And it says the US Department has in a report commissioned by it and made public recently warned that China is offering blah, blah, blah. Okay. Mm. Uh, the same thing. This is in Sri Lanka. This is also May 18. Uh, so in many reports in the media, it says that the, the State Department commissioned the study. So those scholars in Harvard did not come up with the idea themselves. They were told to write it. And then it was sent to back to the State Department. And the State Department said, oh, look, we found this fantastic scientific report from Harvard, <laughs> which tells the story of how China. So anyway, so they, they couldn't cover. But then the same year, the State Department, it, its financial report to the, to the Congress to ask for more money for the next uh, financial year. What they say there is interesting because they say uh, that they had in, two, in 2018, they had a multi-language team of uh, linguists and you know, narrative specialists working with the department's Bureau of International Information Program and so on. And it says that what we found, we found after them spreading all this stuff all over the planet, saying we we observed growing use of the term debt trap diplomacy to describe Chinese investments. And then they say the department continues to message on this subject, delivering additional high performing materials, including Harvard study warns of perilous debt trap diplomacy. So all American embassies all over the planet they spread this material to the media, to NGOs, to you know, uh, activists, bloggers, and of course, paid money in that process. So the State Department is saying, look, give us more money so we can put out more dirt on China in international media. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the debunking of so congress especially under the trump administration and in 20 uh late even under biden they gave more money to anti-chinese propaganda and this was a bill which was passed in the senate unanimously i mean the two parties in the united states they fight against about everything but they agree on russia and china and the terrible u.s policies internationally so this is Strategic Competition Act of 2021. And it says there should be authorization of $300 million a year for five years. So each year, $300 million will go to the fund for countering Chinese influence uh, <laughs> uh, mm. through the State Department. Now, the State Department has an office it's called Human Rights, Democracy, and Labor Office, which has branches in every American embassy in the world. And what is their job? Well, they will take the money appropriated to them by Congress. And what they do is that they will train local media around the world uh, to you know, both find bad things about China and the Belt and Road Initiative, they name it by name, and that there should be accountability <laughs> for these things. So the United States creates the story, a fake story, and they say, oh, the fake story has spread all over the world, uh, but we are spreading them. Now we need the people in those countries themselves to spread the story so it becomes more credible. So if somebody in Iraq, or in Sri Lanka, or in South Africa, 
from that country, a journalist or activist starts saying these things, then it will have more credibility than we saying this. So it, this is, uh, at, the money went through and there was this big scandal in Zimbabwe last September, yeah. 2021, mm -hmm. where the government discovered, I mean, Zimbabwe is now the largest cooperation partner with, with China. They have many cooperation agreements with China, many Chinese investments, and the government is in a volatile situation. Elections are coming. And there, then they, the story came out that the US embassy in Zimbabwe was organizing courses for journalists, bloggers, uh, and civil society NGOs and activists who are against the government to, to train them how to write bad things about the Belt and Road and Chinese investments in Zimbabwe. And one of the participants leaked out that they were offered $1,000 for each article or video or whatever. Now, so you see the whole story, how it was built up, how it was spread. And unfortunately, people buy this story because it's all over the place. Nobody cares mm -hmm. about checking the facts, looking. I mean, I, I, I spent many, many, many hours reading through the Pakistani and Sri Lankan central bank records. Now, of course, nobody is able, not everybody is able to do this terrible work, you know, to figure out what they are saying there, you know, with the numbers and you, you compare the numbers and also, but the, the, there's a horrendous lack of, you know, uh, a moral stance to be able to say, well, this is not true. You know, let us look at this, look at the, the details and so on and so forth. But then there's this peer pressure, this enormous pressure in the media everywhere uh, to, uh, to believe uh, these lies uh, because people are surrounded by them the whole time. So that, that's really where the whole debt trap thing started and it continues. I mean, it was debunked many times. I mean, I wrote about this already in 2018 when this story came out. I, pointed at where it comes from, the source of it. But of course, I don't have the same ability as the Western media uh, and the State Department to, to reach out to people in the world. But you know, it is getting out to, to a relatively good number of people. But it's important that people in governments in, in Africa, in Asia, in South America, don't, they don't believe this thing. That's why, and this is what is an irony, the more bad things they say about the Belt and Road, the more nations join it. Didn't anybody <laughs> ask that question? If it's so bad, if it has been bad since the beginning, why so many countries are joining it? They are joining it because they realize that this is the fantastic way of economic cooperation, developing those countries, and the idea of win-win is true. It's not a trick, it's not a tactic, and therefore that's where I think the world, I mean, our job is not to promote China. Our job is not job, but our mission as a Schiller Institute uh, is to make sure that Sweden, Europe, and the United States joins the project rather than works against it, because it's beneficial for us here, not only mm -hmm. for China or the developing countries.